Someone has said, and I think rightfully so, that living in the family is both exhilarating and exasperating. That living in the family produces some of life's greatest joys, but it also produces some of life's greatest frustrations and some of life's greatest challenges. And there's a reason that living in the family is often exasperating. We're not perfect. None of us are perfect. There are no perfect husbands, there are no perfect wives, there are no perfect mothers, there are no perfect fathers, there are no perfect children, there are no perfect adolescents, there are not even any perfect grandparents, amazingly. None of us are perfect. Many of you know the show from decades ago titled Father Knows Best. Robert Young was the star of that show, and again, this was decades ago. But in that show, Robert Young always had the right answer. He was the wisest father you could possibly have. He was the most caring father you could possibly have. He was the most sensitive father you possibly could have. Robert Young always got it right in that television show. But then he told about the occasion when his daughter came to him and she said to him, Dad, how is it that on television you can solve the most complex problems amazing And then here at home, you do the most stupid things. (laughs) Ever done that? Husbands, wives, parents, children. We've all done stupid things in the family. We can do better. We each can step up and help the family be happier and healthier and more loving. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. What you and I can do to help the family be happier and healthier and more loving. First of all this, we each can learn to listen better. If we want family life to be happier and healthier and more loving, we each need to learn to listen better. I learned many years ago that I needed to work on my listening skills. Our daughter, now an adult, was then about nine or ten years old. I had come home from work from the church that day, and I'd settled, I'd changed clothes, settled into my easy chair, gotten the paper, as was my practice, and I had the paper sitting, uh, reading it in my, in my chair. My daughter came in, and, and she said, Dad, I want to tell you about school today. I said, okay, honey. So I lowered the paper a bit and turned to look at her, and she began to tell me about her day. Well, as tends to happen sometimes with us, I began to kind of glance down to the paper, glance back at her, nod my head as I was seemingly listening to her. And then after a few moments, she grabbed the paper out of my hand and she said, Daddy, you're not listening to me. You're not listening to me. I was hearing, but I wasn't listening. Some time ago, uh, I was in a premarital session with a young couple And I think you know all of us clergy have what are called premarital sessions with persons that we're going to marry. And I was in this premarital session with this particular couple, and we were talking on that occasion in the sessions about communications, about constructive, fruitful communication. And as we're talking about communications, the husband-to-be says this to me and to his wife-to-be, you know, I'm just not a good listener. And my response to that, as diplomatically as I could say it was, get over it. Get over it. If you think that you can have a lasting and loving marriage and you're just not a good listener and you're not going to do anything about it, you better get over it. One therapist says that being a good listener is really rather simple. This therapist says that the formula for being a good listener is this. Stop, look, and listen. When the person who matters to you comes to you and wants to talk to you, stop what you're doing. Look at the person. Really look at the person because in stopping and looking, you're probably going to listen. It's a simple formula for each of us to step up in being better listeners. Stop, look, and listen because the person who is talking to us matters to us. Second thing, we need to learn to be more respectful. 
we need in the home to learn to be more respectful of one another. There's a social commentary on the family that's rather sad that goes like this. Home is the place you go when you're tired of being polite and respectful to others. Let that sink in. Home is the place you go when you're tired of being polite and respectful to others. The Apostle Paul here in the 13th chapter of Corinthians says, love is not rude. And if you look at various translations of that Greek word for rude, you will find it will also say love is not discourteous. Love is not disrespectful. I made a list of what I think it means to be respectful of one another in the home. Let me share it with you. This is what respect is, as I see it. It's parents respecting that our children are different than us and are growing up in a different time and thus not expecting them to be just like us. It's fathers and mothers teaching sons and daughters that women are equal and have unique gifts that make family, community, and the workplace better places. It's husbands respecting the demands of the wife mother and stepping up to do our part in the domestic responsibilities within the home and to ease the load. It's wives respecting the unique demands of men in our modern changing world. It's children and teenagers respecting the experiences we adults have, have had over the years that guide our decisions. It's each family member, husbands, wives, parents, children, respecting each other enough to watch the tone in our voices and the words we use when we disagree. It's grandparents respecting their children and trusting their decisions for child rearing, even if different from before. It's every family member being willing to say as often as necessary the two most healing words you can speak in the family, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Third thing, we parents need to recognize that our children are watching us and learning from us. We parents need to understand, and I think you probably do, that our children are watching us and they're learning something from us. Some years ago, Herbert Parker, a retired school teacher, wrote a little piece called I'll Be Like You, and it goes like this. It's a father and a son. To get his goodnight kiss, he stood beside my chair one night and raised an eager face to me, a face with love alight. And as I gathered in my arms the son God gave to me, I thanked the lad for being good and hoped he'd always be. His little arms crept around my neck, and then I heard him say, Four simple words I shan't forget, four words that made me pray. They turned a mirror on my soul, on secrets no one knew. They startled me, I hear them yet. He said, I'll be like you. What does it mean, dads? For your children, including this dad, to be like you. What does it mean, moms? To know that your children will be like you. Someone said there are seven things our children learn from us. Let me share them with you. These are seven things our children learn from us one way or the other. How to treat other people, whether or not to be truthful, how to handle disappointment, how to accept our shortcomings and do better, whether we are here in this life to be served or to serve, how to handle disagreement with maturity, how much spiritual things matter in this life. And that list really could go on and on. Parents, this one included, our children are watching us and they're learning some things from us. Final thing, if we're to have happy, healthy, more loving families, then we need to embrace the habits which make a difference. I know a Christian therapist who has a unique prescription in working with families. And this particular Christian therapist works with families on marriage issues, on parenting issues, on sibling issues, on all sorts of issues that strain and stress the family. And this therapist, again, has a unique prescription. He says, if I'm going to continue to be your therapist, you will do this. And he gives them a portion of 1 Corinthians 13. And he tells them that they are to read it and pray over it 
every Sunday night or every Monday morning as they begin the week. And then midweek, either Wednesday or on Thursday, they are to read over it and pray over it once again. Now, this therapist tells his clients, I will not be your therapist if you do not follow this prescription. Every Sunday night, every Monday morning, you will read and pray over this portion of 1 Corinthians 13, and midweek, halfway through the week, you will do the same. And he gives them this portion of 1 Corinthians 13 and let it sink in as it needs to sink into me. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Envy. Love is not arrogant. Love does not dishonor others. Love is not self-seeking. Love is not easily angered. Love does not catalog mistakes made. Love always protects, always trusts. Love seeks to persevere. I have a feeling that if Richard Smith took that prescription and every Sunday night or every Monday morning or every Tuesday or every Wednesday or every Thursday, I read that portion of 1 Corinthians 13 and I prayed over it in my life, I would be a better husband and a better father and a better grandfather. And I have a feeling, hokey as it may seem, trite as it may seem, that if every one of you in this sanctuary took that prescription and you read over that portion at least of 1 Corinthians 13 at the beginning of the week and midway through the week and you pray that God would help you be that kind of person, let me tell you something, hokey as it may sound, your marriages would be better. My marriage would be better. Your parenting would be better my parenting would be better. Your relationships with each other in the family would be better. And mine would be better. Hokey as it may sound, there is truth in living those habits that can change family life. I'm with you. That some of the most joyous moments of my life have been in the family. And I'm with you that some of the most frustrating moments of my life have been in the family. And I know that I'm not a perfect husband or a perfect father or a perfect grandfather. And I know you're not perfect husbands and perfect wives and perfect parents and perfect children. We can do better. We can do our part to make family life happy, healthy, and more loving. We do that, first of all, by committing to really listening. We do it, secondly, by working at respecting one another in each of our places in family life. We parents doing that, do that by understanding our children are watching us and they're learning from us. And we all do it when we practice the holy habit of love, real love. Thanks be to God. May this be true of you. May this be true of me. Call your attention to our closing.